Hello everyone. I've never done a uh, cooking video before, but when I did my last uh, video on the Rhodesian Light Infantry and their equipment, I had uh, mentioned that when I went to the field I was going to take an uh, American meal ready to eat, and that didn't seem very authentic. So I um, still had some questions about the equipment of the uh, Rhodesian Light Infantry, and I, I found an excellent book called uh, Fire Force by Chris Cox. And in chapter 19, it goes into great detail about the uniform and equipment. So I made some modifications to my uh, kit from the last video. But I'm also going to uh, try to be authentic with the uh, Rhodesian rations. And if you'll forgive me, I, I'm going to have to read uh, to you directly from his book. So you can just fast forward if you don't want to be read to. When on patrol, we were issued with standard army ration packs or rat packs. There were several varieties of these packs, each containing a different selection of canned food. The favorites were the C and D packs, which contained, amongst other items, tinned pilchards. Now, being an American, I didn't know what a pilchard was, but I had uh, literally had visions of sugar plums. I thought it would be like a, some figs and a nice syrup or something like that. So to my complete and total horror and disgust, I found out that a pilchard is like a fat, juicy sardine in tomato sauce. But I digress. Which contained, amongst other items, tinned pilchards and bully beef, corned ham, frankfurters, and fish were all popular. The ration in each pack was designed to feed one man for one day, but in reality could be stretched to last for two days if necessary. Every pack contained a packet of rice, peanuts, a tube of butter, a tube of jam, salt, sweets, glucose tablets, curry powder, chutney, and a packet of dog biscuits that were delicious if soaked in water overnight, then fried in butter. As a footnote to this water saga, I should add that we were all very fond of our tea brews, and having a lot of Englishmen in the commando were continually stopped, stopping to brew up. We all looked forward to these breaks with relish, and within five minutes of stopping, we'd be drinking fresh hot tea. I should perhaps record that I always kept a hip flask of brandy in my pack and a tot in my evening coffee often lulled my weary body into a temporary semblance of a state of well-being. So I went to uh, the grocery store and various other stores in order to come up with the closest thing I could to these uh, Rhodesian rations and the food that they use to supplement their rations. So I'm going to uh, start with the last item that Chris Cox mentioned and uh, I went to the liquor store and I got some uh, Paul Masson peach brandy. Now in the United States Army, uh, it was very frowned upon to use any type of alcohol, so I never took alcohol to the field in my U.S. Army career. Um, when I went to Italy, however, I remember their field rations had a, a little uh, packet of uh, grappa, which is a, uh, is it a plum brandy, a grape, grape brandy that's uh, integral to the Italian culture. Um, so. I guess the assumption in the United States is that if there's alcohol, there's going to be drunkenness. And since we're operating weapons and tanks and armored personnel carriers, uh, it just was a highly punishable offense to drink alcohol in, in the field. Chris Cox mentioned that the um, Rhodesian rations included a rice packet. So I bought this um, pre-cooked rice, um, like minute rice. So basically it's been boiled uh, and then dried out so that when you go to cook it again it only takes 10 minutes. It's interesting that they did all this cooking in the field. Um, in my day, which was started in the 1980s, you know, we already had MREs in the U.S. Army and the whole idea was that you wouldn't have to cook. Um, I can imagine there might be an operational security problem depending on where you cooked and what the tactical situation was. Uh, the cooker itself is producing flame, and there's going to be a lot of odor associated with cooking. Uh, so there's just nothing I ever... I never saw soldiers uh, carrying gas cookers uh, to the field in the U.S. Army. Um, maybe the heat up coffee, like if I was in a battalion headquarters or a brigade headquarters where we were not on the front line far enough back that we didn't really have to worry about operational security, then we'd have soldiers that would... Uh, heat water so they can make coffee. Coffee is very popular among Americans, but I'm odd because I only drink Coca-Cola and drinks like that. I'm, I'm not really a fan of hot beverages. So my understanding is that bully beef is the same thing as corned beef. 
Um, and you know, most British Commonwealth countries, I think, call it corned beef. But anyway, uh, for whatever reason, Chris Cox referred to it as bully beef. By the way, these uh, tins of bully beef uh, were what the Rhodesian SAS buried in the road to uh, make their enemies think that the road was mined. So, uh, you know, they'd have a mixture of mines and cans. And the uh, communist terrorists actually went so far as to blow up the buried uh, bully beef tins with shape charges. So it was a very cost-effective way of uh, both slowing down the enemy and getting the enemy to expend uh, resources. So save your bully beef cans. Chris Cox mentioned that the Rhodesian rashes included peanuts, and I'm very lucky that I have a cousin who's a retired Navy captain, and she is also the manager of a nut factory. So. Uh, I get my peanuts for free. I don't even know how to pronounce Bovril, B-O-V-R-I-L, Bovril, Bovril, and uh, I googled it and it doesn't really seem to exist anymore, and I went to the grocery store not expecting to find anything, but I think this is pretty close. It's an uh, infusion of beef, and uh, it's like roasted beef and beef broth, yeast, and it's got uh, caramelized onions in it. And this sounds about like what this Bovril stuff was. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if any Rhodesians are watching this, but uh, I assume this would have been mixed in with the rice just to add some calories and some flavor. Glucose tablets make a lot of sense because glucose is a sugar that can doesn't have to be metabolized. It can basically be absorbed directly into the bloodstream, so it's very quick energy. And glucose tablets can be found in the uh, diabetic supply sections of a pharmacy. I couldn't find a tube of butter or any packaged butter that I thought would survive at all in the field. But then I remembered that the uh, American MRE cheese is about one degree away from butter. It's this really flavorless, uh, homogenized uh, product that probably more like butter than cheese. It might have a little artificial cheese flavoring added to it. So this is gonna be my butter substitute. Coffee is something that the Americans and the Rhodesians have in common in their ration pack. So this is simply a uh, accessory pack from an MRE and it contains coffee, sugar, and a non-dairy creamer and some delicious chiclets. I'm not sure what corned ham is in Rhodesia. It's actually a recipe that's popular in North Carolina, which is um, kind of where I'm from. Um, so anyway, I got this potted ham, potted meat that's got a lot of ham in it. It's very similar to Spam, so I'm not sure if that's what's meant by corned ham. Uh, it's a different thing than it is in the United States. One thing that makes a tremendous amount of sense for a field ration is um, biltong. And uh, biltong is similar to beef jerky, but better. And if anybody's interested in making their own biltong, biltong uh, Suzelle DIY in South Africa has an excellent video on how to make biltong uh, from scratch. And I'll have my editor put the link here. I wonder if the Frankfurters and the Rhodesian uh, field rations were pretty much the same as what we'd call Vienna sausages, just little tiny hot dogs in a can. I thought it was really interesting that the Rhodesian rations included chutney, and I guess the British Empire's long experience in India uh, probably made chutney part of the uh, Commonwealth military menu. I'd never seen this before, but I found it in my own grocery store on a shelf I often overlook, and it's like basically like a jar of beef, so it's somewhere between uh, corned beef and biltong, so I figured it would be appropriate. I went ahead and got a plastic squeeze bottle of grape jelly to be my tube of jelly. Curry powder is another nod to the British experience in India. I suspect that Chris Cox brought a fresh onion and fresh garlic to the field with him, but I actually just got a garlic powder and minced onions, uh, packaged spices. Interestingly though, a few months from now, there'll be wild garlic growing all around me. It's just a very uh, ubiquitous plant in the mid-Atlantic uh, United States where I'm from. There's just wild garlic growing everywhere. If you dig it up, there's like a little garlic bulb, and but then there's a, a grass-like um, thing that grows up from the bulb that's also very tasty and can be used to uh, flavor dishes. 
it's uh, related to something called Ramp in West Virginia. And uh, West Virginia is where I'll actually film the uh, field portion of this series of videos. I also got some lemonade while I was at it. And one little tidbit I'd like to mention is I'm going to use iodine to disinfect my water. And the uh, citric acid in both the orangeade and the lemonade have the effect of uh, precipitating out the iodine. So if you have nasty tasting iodine water and you add uh, some type of lemonade or orangeade that has citric acid in it, it will greatly improve the flavor. But the thing is that you have to let the iodine work first. So let the water stand with the iodine in it for at least 30 minutes to kill all the pathogens. And then you can add the lemonade to uh, remove the iodine flavor. I'm not normally a tea drinker, but I uh, want to have the experience of uh, brewing up. So I got a box of tea bags. I got my salt and sugar compliments of the U.S. Army. This came from an MRE, but this sugar actually was contained in a packet of uh, flatware. So normally in the U.S. Army, when we were in the field, the ration cycle would be a hot breakfast and then an MRE for lunch and then a hot supper. And when we got the hot breakfast and the hot supper, we'd get a little packet of flatware, plastic forks and spoons, and inside would be sugar. Chris Cox mentioned uh, sweets. And they're the British, the British call um, hard candy uh, boiled sweets. So Jolly Ranchers are really delicious. And I remember being a boy in the 1970s, which would have been during the Rhodesian Bush War, and uh, Jolly Ranchers were popular at that time, so I'm not sure if Jolly Ranchers were a thing in Rhodesia, but they were definitely a thing in the 1970s in the United States. Nothing could be more Scottish than some Lorna Dunes, and these little packages are very durable and waterproof and would make an excellent uh, component of a field ration. When I was with the Italian Army, they had these delicious little cubes of what I would describe as a tea biscuits. So I'm not sure if this is similar to the biscuits that were in the uh, Rhodesian field rations, but I do recall the Italians having these little um, aluminum cubes of, of these type of biscuits, and they were delicious. One thing I couldn't find anywhere is powdered milk. I guess that's just not a thing anymore. I mean, powdered milk used to be a staple of uh, diet decades ago, but I don't know if it's a supply chain issue or if people just don't drink powdered milk anymore, but there was none to be found. However, imported from England, I did find this delicious Nesquik uh, banana flavoring for milk. And I've got some powdered strawberry milk on the way, so hopefully by the time uh, we have our uh, field video, the uh, powdered milk will be available again. Beans and Franks are also popular in the United States, or at least they were, but I couldn't find any in my grocery store. So that's something else I had to order from Amazon.com. Um, we call them beanie weenies in the United States since the beans and the weenie is short for wiener. Um, these are not beanie weenies, but they come in a can about like this with a little pull tab and they're very convenient. And in fact, when I was in the uh, North Carolina Army National Guard, I had a soldier who didn't like any of the food that was served in the field, hot or cold. And he brought a duffel bag full of beanie weenies and he lived for 15 days eating nothing but beanie weenies. So they must provide adequate nutrition. Wow, thanks to the miracle of Amazon.com, the beanie weenies came just as I was filming this video. I just want to talk about one last thing which might add a little element of uh, fresh vegetable to a field uh, ration and that is uh, what the United States grocery stores sometimes call a kiwano but I think is more locally known as a horned melon and that is a southern African uh, delicacy should I say the first time I ever heard of this was in a book by Elizabeth Marshall about the uh, Bushmen of the Kalahari. And as you can see, this is just a very juicy and succulent uh, melon. It's almost like jello inside. And even though it has a lot of seeds, I think it also has a lot of nutrition. And it's an important source of, of water for the Bushmen of the Kalahari because basically it's just, just full of of liquidy pulp and uh, anyway 
I happened to, I, after reading about this, I, I was in uh, my local grocery store in the produce section, and on one occasion they had these horned melons, and I bought one, and it's just chock full of seeds. So my daughter and I saved the seeds, and we planted them in our garden two years in a row. So we just have um, dozens and dozens of these horned melons, and they store for a long time, too. You can see the skin is really thick, and uh, so it's just a nice little Southern African delicacy that I can have here in the Mid-Atlantic United States, and uh, it's a gift that keeps on giving because uh, even if we don't plant them, they come up by themselves now, so it's kind of nice. So after going through everything on Chris Cox's list, I'd just like to give my opinion about what I think are really the combat-ready uh, elements of this list. Um, one thing I'd like to say is I'm not a coffee drinker, but I needed my caffeine, and there weren't any Coke machines out in the woods at Fort Bragg. So what I would do is I would take my freeze-dried coffee, and I would pour it in my packet of sugar, and then I would just eat the whole thing and that way I, it tasted halfway decent because of the sugar and uh, I got my caffeine fixed that way. The orange aid powder is extremely uh, durable and waterproof and lightweight and it would take the nasty taste out of uh, iodine water or even uh, you know I was usually with a infantry company or something and we'd have a water trailer but the water would still be nasty just from the taste of whatever you know the water source or the trailer itself so it's good to have something in the field to flavor water with uh, biltong is delicious high energy it's got salt in it everything you need for the field and it's in a very uh, durable uh, waterproof container jolly ranchers are delicious now if i was in the hot humid field for 15 days or something the hard candies would just start to melt over a period of time but it would still hold up pretty well, and if you put them in a Ziploc bag with maybe a little bit of a ab absorbent or something, they'd probably survive better. The little lightweight canned foods, very similar to sea rations, which were before my time, but um, beanie weenies and Vienna sausages would be definite winners. In the U.S. Army, we always carried like Texas Pete hot sauce or something, and the idea was if you got some food you didn't like, because uh, you had to have whatever hot meal they served you, so let's say you didn't like scrambled eggs or fried fish or whatever you could just douse it in hot sauce so for me the curry sort of would serve the same purpose and it's in a nice plastic container that's not going to get broken or anything so i would definitely take the curry to the field with me lorna dunes i mean who can resist lorna dunes now i imagine they could easily be crushed I and mean, one might end up with a little bag of crumbs but that'd be fine you could just open them up and pour them in your mouth so i would definitely uh endorse the lorna dunes and the package is, uh, you know, this is a nice little portion and it's waterproof and durable. Glucose tablets make a lot of sense and they also come in a very nice uh, durable container. So I could definitely see myself bringing these to the field. I've also seen them as part of uh, first aid kits or uh, medical kits or survival kits. And it's really quick energy that you need. And that reminds me of something, uh, and this cup reminds me of the same thing. Uh, about exactly two years ago, I attended uh, the Aboriginal Living Skills Schools Desert Drifter course, which is taught by Cody Lundeen. And if that name sounds familiar to you, Cody Lundeen was the uh, star of a Discovery Channel TV show called Dual Survival for several seasons. He's a barefoot hippie. He's about uh, one year younger than me, I think. Uh, so he's in his 50s now as well. And we trekked all over the Arizona desert and we didn't have any food except he did let us have one Ziploc bag full of trail mix. So what I actually experienced on the Desert Drifter course was something I had known all along, but it was like, you don't need food. I mean, I could probably stand to lose 30 pounds um, as it is, and that's a lot of calories. And 3,000 calories a day, that's about a pound of fat every day, so I could probably go 30 days without food and still and actually be healthier for it. In this desert drifter course, we were hiking all over the desert. Um, it wasn't really hot weather, it was dry weather. And we were just hiking from water source to water source. And we were using some pretty nasty water sources. For example, um, the land that we were hiking in was used by ranchers. They, they rent the land from the Bureau of Land Management. It's federal property, but it's leased to the cattle ranchers, and it's also open to recreation. 
said there were these um, ponds just sort of dug in the desert and they were just filled with this nasty scummy water with um, cow manure in it, uh, fresh from the cow. And that's where we get our water. And we would use actually like medical tincture of iodine to disinfect the water. And we were, we were fine. And, um, but the more you eat, the more water you need, just like Chris Cox outlined in his uh, Fire Force book. And it's really true. Now, I think the lack of food did cause weakness, but I never felt hungry. I was never like, oh, I'm so hungry, I'm gonna die or anything. Was, at no time during the week without food was I actually hungry. I, I did feel weak going up hills and um, I'd get to a water source where maybe you had to climb down a bank and I just wouldn't feel like doing it because it was such an effort. So I think one gets like weak and lazy when you don't have food. So it's kind of nice to have like a glucose tablet or something to give you that pep of energy when you need it. So the reason this cup reminds me of the Cody Lundin course is uh, this was the canteen cup that I used. You can see it's well burnt. But um, eventually we made our way to a river and as we hiked along the river, we camped on an island in the river and there were all these little crawfishes around the river. And my teammates, or about eight other people in the course, um, ate the crawfishes. But um, being a humanitarian person that I am, I didn't want to murder a crayfish just to have like a fourth of a mouthful to eat. But there were these delicious cattails that were also growing in the river. And so if you strip down to the bottom of a cattail, it's almost like celery. So I made myself uh, some delicious celery soup in this canteen. and. Uh, didn't have a lot of calories, but it filled my stomach up. And also, um, Cody did give us some vegetable bouillon. And I think that salt water, that hot salt water and the celery just really, it was probably one of the most delicious meals I had in my, in my life because I was starving to death. And um, I think the salt and the bouillon water just really, uh, really did make me feel quite good. And the fire that I used to, uh, heat the water was made with a bow drill set so that was pretty cool too a bow drill set that i had made with nothing but a mora knife and some cottonwood and a willow uh, spindle now i'm a person who spends a lot of time backpacking a little bit of time mountaineering i scuba dive i just love going out in nature um, however i'm also a person who was a bachelor for many years and i didn't even cook in my own apartment i took all my meals out I never even ran my own dishwasher because I never got dishes dirty. And the only uh, other stove I owned was a multi-fuel stove that I had to have on a mountaineering uh, course. And we were camped out on a glacier, so the only way to get water was to use a stove to melt snow. Um, so this is new to me. I've never had one before, but this is a uh, combination propane-butane uh, canister. And then one just screws the stove itself on top. And if you have a metal cup or a mess kit or whatever, you can just set it on, on this stove and heat the water up. Okay, now we're gonna see if I blow myself up. All right, we've lit the stove. Now here's the part where I do math in public. My recipe calls for a quart of water, and I know a quart's about a liter, so a liter's a thousand milliliters. So if I put 500 milliliters in this cup, I should be able to make half as much rice because the entire amount of rice would be way too much. Now we will just put the canteen cup on the stove. Hopefully it doesn't fall over. And put the lid on the canteen cup and bring the water to a boil. While we're waiting for the water to boil, I'm gonna go ahead and divide this quart portion of rice in two. I'm assuming there's a geometric relationship between water and rice. Hopefully there's no vertical asymptote when you get to half as much rice. It would help, help if I use the sharp end of the knife. All right, so here's 
today's meal and here's tomorrow's meal. Boy, that blue flame is really beautiful. And it's not too terribly bright, so I don't think this would be too bad for operational security either. Hmm. Looks like the water is just uh, starting to boil. So now I've added the rice and it's just a matter of waiting 10 minutes. Okay, well I boiled the rice for 10 minutes and it's still awfully soupy, so I'm gonna let it sit for a couple minutes to see if it absorbs more of the water. Well, another couple of minutes have passed and it's still soupy, so now let's see if I can drain it without scalding myself. nice hot cup of rice. Now I'm going to test my hypothesis about MRE cheese spread actually being flavored butter. So I'm just going to cut the corner of the package off. That's what I always did in the field. And that way you just have a little tiny hole and you can squeeze the cheese, the suspected cheese, out. Now we'll add the iodized salt. And in the spirit of English speaking armies everywhere, some curry powder. The proof's in the pudding. Not too bad. Lastly, I'd like to say that I had uh, shot all the footage of the uh, Rhodesian late infantry food uh, video, and my daughter had it for editing, and I turned on YouTube, and I was shocked and dismayed to find that 5 Romeo Romeo had beaten me to the punch and done the exact same video, but of course his is a lot more authentic since he's an actual Rhodesian infantryman, and I'm just exploring uh, what it might be like to be a Rhodesian late infantryman using their equipment, gear, and food. So my apologies to 5 Romeo Romeo. I wasn't copying off you. Uh, it's amazing that we produced uh, essentially the same video independently of each other. Um, but anyway, hopefully you'll enjoy this one too. And stay tuned for our next video where we actually go to the field and put into practice the uniform equipment, tactics, techniques, and procedures of the Rhodesian late infantry. I'll see you then. Good boy. Good boy. Is the camera still rolling?